Our Father and our God, we are grateful for the opportunity to be in your house today. We thank you for your word, this love letter to each one of us. As we spend these few moments delving into it, I pray that our hearts will be fed, that indeed we will be different because we came. Now speak to each one of us in a language that we can understand. For in Jesus' name I pray, amen. You may take your seats. Greetings to all of you. Good morning. It is my greatest pleasure to be back and especially to share this service of family thanksgiving. You see, we are gathered this morning to help each other develop or create a heart of gratitude, to develop a heart of gratitude, to be a thankful people, to learn to be thankful first to God as a maker of all things, and also to be thankful for each other. And for that reason, I must begin by saying thank you to all of you for listening to me. I want to say thank you to the leadership of this cathedral for giving me the opportunity to stand before you, but above all, to thank God for the gift of life and the privilege to share God's word this morning. I also want to thank the children for doing such a great job in rendition of the birth of Jesus Christ. And may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to the Lord God of heaven, our maker, as I share this morning. As I was thinking about Thanksgiving, my mind turned to King David there in Psalm 95 that was read to us and the man is inviting us to a worship experience. David is inviting us to a great time of thanksgiving to the living God of heaven, saying, Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great king above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth, and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Come, let us bow down in worship, let us kneel before the Lord our maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. And today, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. And friends, this is an invitation to extravagant celebration of our God with shouts of voice and music. David is inviting us to uplift the name of the great God of heaven because he is worthy to worship the maker of heaven and earth, to kneel before our God. He is our God. And we are his people, the flock under his care. So come one, come all, this morning, and let us rejoice and give thanks to God. You see, friends, thanksgiving often comes with celebration. And you can probably remember the last celebration that you had, perhaps after graduation, perhaps after the birth, of your baby. What a bash it was. This is the spirit of gratitude. Learning 
to say thank you to God without any apologies whatsoever. It is also right and appropriate to say thank you to those around you. Saying thank you to your spouse. Saying thank you to your children. Saying thank you to your friends. Anyone and everyone who deserves thanksgiving. And perhaps I should ask you, as I proceed, have you had a chance to say thank you to someone? Have you, your wife, your children, your husband? You know, I feel I need to challenge you to turn to someone right now and say thank you to them. Just turn around and say thank you to them. Perhaps you did not even know who was sitting next to you, but turn to them anyway. And because you have this muffler, I'm not sure what you are saying, but I believe you are saying thank you to someone. How lovely. And how good to learn to be a thankful people. And I want, before you leave this compound this morning, to think of someone that you will say thank you to for something they've done for you. But as I was thinking about Thanksgiving, I began to reflect on our daily interactions and conversations. And what do I hear? I hear voices. I hear tones of ingratitude. People whining. I hear people complaining just about everything. The question in my mind is, are we increasingly becoming some ungrateful people? Are we creating a culture of ingratitude? And I wanted us to make this personal. When was the last time you said thank you to your spouse or someone else for something good they did for you? When was the last time you took the time to say thank you to God anyway? Have we become a bunch of takers and not givers? You see, we are more likely to complain just about everything. It's either too wet or it's either too dry. It's either too cold or too hot. Our politicians are not this or the other. My husband or wife and the children are not what I expected. My employer is a complete waste of time. But of course, you take the paycheck every month without fail. The food has too much salt or not enough. And the glass is either half full or half empty. And then, of course, the drivers on the roads are all not cases except yourself. Problems, problems everywhere. Nothing works. You can't possibly think of anything to thank God for or anyone else for that matter. You see, genuine thanksgiving, friends, is an attitude of the heart and the mind. Never at all about what you have or what you don't have. You don't thank God because you have more than your neighbor. No, not really. You don't thank God because you have arrived in whatever sense of that word. You thank God because you have allowed the living God of heaven to create a heart of contentment in your heart, no matter the circumstances. You see, the kingdom of God is not built on human might, but on God himself. God's ways, remember, are not our ways. As a matter of fact, you refuse to live under the circumstances, but you thank God for all things. You can therefore say 
with the hymn writer, whatever my Lord, you have taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. And you can therefore thank God in your heart, whatever you are Lord. It's not about who you are, but to whom you belong. And there is a big difference between the two. The Apostle Paul had learned the secret of a grateful heart. And it is that secret that I want us to learn today if we don't know. And hear him talking to the believers in Philippi. They're in chapter 4. I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. And then this man of God made this great declaration there in verse 13. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. Talk about developing a heart of gratitude. And by the way, do you know that Paul was in prison when he penned the letter to the church in Philippi? The letter also known the letter of joy. A man behind bars writing to encourage those in the free world. And you can imagine a guy in committee, uh, if he hasn't run away, writing to encourage those on the outside to, heart, to have a heart of gratitude. Truly, truly amazing, no doubt. And I know we quote this scripture every so often, but friends, today, I want us to make this a special day to deliberately and intentionally give thanks to God for the good things he has done in our land. Just sang the national anthem. And remembering that today is Jamuhuri Day, we thank God for our land. We thank God for the good things he has done in our lives the good things he had done for this congregation and the good things God has done in the lives of our family members in the last 12 months or so. Friends, when you take time to pause and remember, you can see those times in your life when God brought you victory, perhaps even when you didn't deserve it, when God brought you success, when you deserved failure, and when you form the habit of remembering the good things God has done for you and learn to praise God for who he is, it will no doubt transform your life. Let us remember that thanksgiving is an attitude of our heart. Living with an attitude of gratitude means that you don't just thank God for what he did in the past, but you also thank him for what he is doing today and what he will do in the future. You thank God for opening new doors even when business opportunities have been destroyed by the COVID-19 pandemic. You thank God for increasing you in ways you did not and could not imagine. You thank God for bringing the right people into your life. It is a declaration of great faith when we thank God in advance. The scripture are calling us to live every day with an attitude of gratitude and thanksgiving. We must move away from this terrible disease called entitlement, which creates greed in the heart leading to unseemly fights, setting brother against brother. Instead, we must allow God to create a heart of contentment from which gratitude grows. Thanksgiving is the expression of gratitude, especially to God. It's a deep response of the heart that feels glad. 
It's an expression of joy from a heart that feels good, fulfilled, and perhaps even elated. Thanksgiving can be the expression of gladness after the attainment of some desired result. This word, the scripture, in many places invite us to thank God and demonstrate a heart of thanksgiving whether things work in the way we thought they would or not. As you can remember, Job cried out in great torment in thanksgiving to God, and he said, even though he slays me, yet will I trust in him. And Habakkuk said this there in chapter 3, reading from verse 17, Though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crops fails, and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen, and no cattle in the stores, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. The sovereign Lord is my strength. What a wonder that was. And you might recall the celebrations after the great rescue there in the Red Sea. It was a time of great anxiety by the Red Sea. The children of Israel are snaking their way to the land of promise. And they come to the shores of the Red Sea and there seems to be no way forward. They are trapped between the sea and the hill country. They turn their eyes and saw the war machine of Pharaoh, Pharaoh in hot pursuit. They were lame ducks. It will soon be over for them. They were obviously not much to the military might of Pharaoh. But then, but then God does not abandon his people. And I want us to remember that that God will not abandon you in your hour of need. God told Moses to stretch his rod over the sea, and a miracle happened. The sea parted and became dry ground, through which all Israelites crossed over to the other side in safety. The war machine of Pharaoh pursued them in the sea, and God caused the water to roar back, killing every one of them. Seeing this miracle of God, Miriam grabbed the tambourine and gathered the people, and they sang together in praise of God, save, saving them from sure death. She said, I will sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. Both horse and driver he has howled into the sea, the Lord is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will praise him, my Father's God, and I will exalt him. Sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. And you might possibly also recall King David, bless his soul. When the Ark of the Covenant arrived in Jerusalem, David could not hold back his joy. The man was wild with joy. Wearing a linen effort, David was dancing before the Lord with all his might. He was leaping up and dancing for his Lord. His wife, Mitchell, thought the king was not dignified enough to dance like that before his subjects, but David declared, I will declare before the Lord, I will become even more undignified than this, and I will be humiliated in my own eyes, lady. Nothing, nobody was going to put down the heart of David that was bursting with joy. And Mary, Mary, the mother of Jesus, in the New Testament, burst out in praise, thanksgiving for the favor of carrying the Savior 
of the world in her, her womb, there in Luke chapter 1, she burst out singing with great joy, saying, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of this servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the mighty one has done a great thing for me. So friends, let us celebrate in thanksgiving. You see, as we come to the end of one of the most trying years of our times, you have a lot to thank God for. We have all gone through the pain. We have gone through the loss. We have gone through the uncertainty caused by COVID-19 pandemic. COVID-19 has not only reorganized the world order as we knew it, but has affected each one of us in far-reaching ways. We have suffered death of our loved ones. We have seen our incomes shrink. We have suffered the death of our businesses. We've been forced to change our life and even to change our way of worship in ways never imagined before. And to add to all this, you could be going through the worst time in your family. And I thank those who came forward for us to pray with you, or you are battling sicknesses, or you are fighting disagreements that may have threatened your marriage. Things are simply very bad for you. Or perhaps for you, you had hopes at the beginning of the year of finding a partner for life. This did not happen. And on and on we can go. And you might just be wondering whether there is anything to celebrate, is there? Anything to be grateful for? And I stand here to say, yes, there is. A thousand times, yes. You know, at a time like this, the old song comes to my mind to encourage my heart. And the song says, count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God has done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. And it will surprise you what the Lord has done. Yes, friend, count your blessings in your family. Look back and see the baby that was born to you or to your family. What a blessing. Thank God for your family. You have a family to go, to go back to. Thank God even for the mundane things we take for granted, perhaps even a car that you drive around. Thank God for your daughter. She finished school and your son just got some employment. Thank God for you alive, while many died in the course of this ending year. Thank God for your country that by and large enjoys peace and tranquility to enable you to live your life. Thank God that you have a roof over your head. Count your blessings, count your blessings that you have food on your table and you have clothes to wear, mundane things that we take for granted. We must develop a heart of gratitude. It was John Templeton, a well-known voice from the past who said this, counting our blessings can transform melancholy into cheerful mass. Laughter and joy are expressions of praise and thanksgiving for life's glories. When looking at the glass that symbolized our life, we can view it as half full or half empty. The choice is ours. The more joyful we are, the more attractive we become. When we feel gratitude for our experiences, it becomes easier to see the good that always exists. When we give a smile to someone, we are likely to receive one in return. 
and that smile reflects a happy heart that is open and receptive to what the good life has in store. So friends, for a moment, forget all the woes, forget all the pains, forget all the tears of this year that is passing on. Count your blessings and it will really surprise you what the Lord has done. If you take this perspective, you realize that you have reason to celebrate, to be thankful, and you can therefore, therefore sing with joy and thanksgiving. So why do we find it so difficult to have a heart of gratitude? To have a lifestyle of thanksgiving? Allow me to suggest that we are susceptible to that terrible disease that captures most people. It is called vain competition. And it comes from greed. Greed is the desire to have everything around you for yourself. Greed tells you that you cannot possibly be happy if you do not have that which belongs to someone else. And when the disease strikes, you go into a frenzy to get everything that those, pe those people who have around you, thinking that then, when you grab that which belongs to someone else, you will be happy. I'm here to tell you, it is not true. You will not be happy, because greed is a bottomless pit. It never gets satisfied. And if you are thinking that way, that you will only be happy, if you get that which belongs to someone else, you are living a lie straight from hell. And that also tells me that you most probably have not read the story of King Solomon, that son of David and Bathsheba. You may recall, the man tried it all and had it all. He got everything his heart desired, but he finally declared that all is vanity and chasing after the wind. And his story, should you be interested, is recorded in his journal known as Ecclesiastes in the Bible. Friend, remember this because it is important. Our heart was made for God and to God it must return to find real purpose and rest. St. Augustine said, restless, restless is the heart until it rests in thee, O Lord. We were made to worship God, not material. Our hearts belong to the maker, and that itinerary preacher of Palestine posed the question, how does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his own soul. And with outstretched hands, our Savior, our elder brother, the Lord Jesus Christ invites all and sundry, saying, Come to me, all of you who are tired and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest for your soul. And that tent maker of Tassas told the young minister, Timothy, godliness with contentment is great gain. You brought nothing, and you will take nothing with you. And I want us to say those words together. One, two, go. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Now, I said we all say this, and I know I cannot see uh, because you have this muffler, but I, I, you cannot say it with your mouth shut, okay? So let's, let's say it together. Godliness with contentment is great gain. You brought nothing, and you will take nothing with you. Thank you. When you consider that God has everything you need, and that he will take care of you in all circumstances, your heart will burst with gladness, and you will sing and shout for joy. Yes, 
you will begin to develop a heart of gratitude. He will help cure that disease called vain um, competition. Now, as I conclude, I want to pick a few benefits of a grateful heart. And I want to suggest these few things for your consideration on how best we can have an attitude of, of uh, gratitude. Firstly, a thankful heart will lead you to God's will for your life. Let me say that again because it is very important. A thankful heart will lead you to God's will for your life. You see, one of the questions which people ask above all else is, how can I know the will of God? How? Can you really know the will of God, they ask? Here the Apostle Paul on this issue of knowing the will of God. He says this in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And I want us to say that together. Rejoice always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Again in Ephesians 5, therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the will the will what, what the Lord's will is. Always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Giving thanks to God for and in everything is the will of God for you. This is important because giving thanks for all things is an expression of faith and trust that all things work together for good to those who believe in God. And that includes what you consider to be the good, the bad, and the ugly. This is knowing, this is accepting that there are no accidents in God's economy. This is accepting that God knows what is best for you. The Bible says that you now see in part, dimly, as in a mirror, that you don't know why the events are happening in a certain way. But looking to God, who knows the whole story, our God knows the beginning, our God knows the end, our God knows in between. He allows things to happen for a purpose. And you can therefore join with the holy hosts of heaven there in Revelation 19 saying, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belong to our God, for our Lord reigns. Our Lord Almighty reigns. Yes, friends, God was in control when that accident happened. Yes, God was in control when you lost the job. God was in control when the doctor said you have some incurable disease. Our God reigns even when your marriage fails. God reigns when the business went belly up. You cannot see it now, but he is in control. You will see it by and by in the, full, in the fullness of time. And David was confident that the Lord had not abandoned him, that the Lord had not handed him to his enemies. There in Psalm 31, verse 8, he said, You have set my feet on a spacious place. Yes, God may be leading you to a spacious place. Are you willing to trust him to lead you on? And for his trouble, Elihu told Job, 
that the Lord was wooing him. That's, that's an interesting word. The Lord was wooing him from the jaws of distress to a spacious place, free from restriction, to the comfort of your table laden with choice foods. Job chapter 35, verse 16. And you know, it might as well be that through the trouble you have seen this year, the last 12 months, through that trouble, God is leading you to a better place that you know nothing about at the moment. Trust God with all the details of your life, especially if you cannot figure out what, uh, why things are happening in a certain way. Rejoice and give thanks to God, for he knows what is best for you. Secondly, give thanks to the Lord Jesus Christ for dying on the cross to purchase your pardon. Because Christ came, we now have access to God. And you should at all times remember God did not love us because we are lovable or because we first loved him. It is God's nature to love. And St. Paul says this in Romans chapter 5. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person. Though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Think about it this morning. Where would you be if Christ did not come? Where would I be if the Son of God did not humble himself and offer his body to be tortured and finally killed on your behalf? At his death on that cruel tree, the curtain in the temple was torn from top to bottom, thus opening the way for me to access the Holy of Holies. Through his dying breath, he said it is finished, and he adopted me and us as sons and heirs of the kingdom of God. We are now free, free indeed. What can I give to Jehovah for the priceless salvation? Oh, so full and free, I will offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving to Jesus Christ for saving me. It is so right, so to do. Also, by his death and resurrection, Jesus has given me full access to God. I'm now a beneficiary of God's love and mercy and his faithfulness that endure for the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations as we read in Psalm 100. Thirdly, when you create an attitude of gratitude, God will strengthen your prayer life. And oh, how we need a strong prayer life. The Apostle Paul, writing to the church in Philippi, says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious. And we are anxious about many things. And perhaps this morning, you are a very anxious person. The Bible says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And what will happen? The Bible says, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. You can exchange your anxiety for God's peace if you take your petitions to him with thanksgiving. Fourthly, remember that when you learn to praise and worship God, 
you are positioning yourself for more blessings. And we read there in Jeremiah chapter 30, this is what the Lord says. Now listen. This is what the Lord says. I will restore the fortunes of Jacob's tents and have compassion on his dwellings. The city will be rebuilt on her ruins and the palace will stand in its proper place. From them will come songs of thanksgiving and the sound of rejoicing. I will add to their numbers and they will not be decreased. I will bring them honor and they will not be disdained. Their children will be as in days of old and their community will be established before me. And finally, learn the attitude of gratitude for our Savior and elder brother, Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus Christ was ever grateful to God as he conducted his ministry here on earth. And he always, always acknowledged his father in all his miracles. And he taught his disciples to thank God even when they celebrated his death and resurrection. We read the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. We remember him in the spirit of thanksgiving. And I commend you to God. And I ask him to teach you and to teach me, to remind each one of us to have a heart of gratitude. Remember to be thankful all the time and under all circumstances, because in God's economy, there are no accidents, only divine appointments. You cannot see it now. You don't see it now, but in the fullness of time, either this side of heaven or there beyond, you will see it and you will thank God that it happened, whatever it is that happened. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, Amen. And I want you to rise now because I want us to pray together. Our Father and our God, we thank you that you have broken the bread of life for each one of us. And as we have thought through and picked on a few things about thanksgiving, creating a heart of gratitude, I am praying for myself as I pray for all these dear ones that indeed you will cause our hearts to remember to be grateful to you for all things that have happened to us and also to look around us in our families, among our friends, and even co-workers, and learn to be thankful, to say thank you to them. And we pray this in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Again, all God's people said, Amen. Thank you very much. You may sit down.